content. Please take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Let's, uh, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he break, uh, speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet if I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. And Lord bless in the reading of his word. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 5. One of the things we often take for granted is the fact that we have a New Testament. Imagine living over 2,000 years ago and you're studying the scripture you're trying to figure out some things, uh, figuring out how God is going to fulfill certain aspects of his promises. How in the world is this going to come about? How are these things going to, going to come together? And uh, there, were, there were several perplexing things in the Old Testament that caused some measure of confusion. I'll wait till the uh, cheerleaders quiet down. They caused some measure of confusion among ancient students of the Scripture. One of these, of course, was that the Messiah comes twice. You don't get that in your Old Testament. You see different aspects of things, but the idea of of Messiah coming twice is not there. As a matter of fact, there are places where you have uh, uh, the Scripture talking about his first coming, and all of a sudden it stops And then even the rest of the verse deals with the second coming. There's a couple of places like that. And so there was, uh, we have the benefit for us with with hindsight. The fact that Messiah comes twice, the first as a a lamb, the second as, as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Another is the fact that Messiah suffers and dies and yet reigns. How is this, how is this possible? And of course, from our perspective, this is all answered by the, by the two advents and the resurrection of Christ. Another was the fact that Messiah is both priest and king. Now, in ancient Israel, uh, and I'll expand on this a little bit more as we get into the body of the message, but the, the, the priests came from one tribe, came from Levi, and the kings came from the, from the tribe of Judah. And since both of them were an inherited position, it was impossible to have a Levitical priest and a Judean king both be the same guy. It just wasn't possible. And yet we have Messiah being a priest and a king, and they were left scratching their heads, how in the world can this be? Uh, The New Testament, of course, clarifies all of these things. You know, the, the, uh, I mean, some of the solutions they tried to come up with before the New Testament, before the advent of Christ, some, there's two messiahs. One is of Judah, one is of Levi. One suffers, one reigns. One, one is a priest, one is a king. They, 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 they figured that solves the problem. But that isn't what, what happened. And that isn't how the, the issue is resolved. The New Testament clarifies the, these, uh, these questions, resolves them all in one person. The Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, he's also more than priest and king. He's, he's prophet too. We're not going to be dealing with that this morning. But he's, he's God incarnate. When Jesus, I, I love this. I mentioned before, one of my, my favorite, and this is personal. This is like <laughs> kind of a thing. Uh, that 
One of my favorite places in the, in the gospel accounts is when Jesus is having his confrontations with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, almost in succession. It's like they're tag teaming, they're taking turns attacking Jesus. And, and how are they attacking Jesus? I know what we'll do. We'll ask him questions he can't answer. Or we'll ask him questions that will put him in a situation that will compromise his role. Well, that's what we'll do. And so they, they planned out their questions. I mean, they've had several years to put these things together. And they, they, they sprung these things on it. And as you read the accounts of this, Matthew 23 and, and, uh, and uh, Mark chapter 12, you will find that Jesus not only answered the questions, he also solved a couple of dilemmas for them along the way, questions they couldn't answer. Uh, but he would turn around and throw it back at them, and then there was a couple of times he asked them a question, and they were like, and they didn't know the answer. Or their pat answer was, the question was, was put in such a way, or he gave an additional passage of Scripture that totally undermined the thing that they had held to. Because our Lord, he's God incarnate. He is ultimately the author of the scripture. He knows what this says. He knows all the implications of it. He knows this thing backwards and forwards. He understands the whys and wherefores. He knows what he's going to do. He knows how this is all going to play out. And these these students of scripture who had spent literally hundreds of years trying to hash all this stuff out, sometimes were wrong because they didn't have all the information and because they were drawing conclusions based on limited information. You know, so often today we have, we have that in the, in the scientific world and, and, and any, any number of other things that people think, oh, it's this way, this is the, these are the facts, this is the way it is, that's question answered, uh, conflict or any, 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 any issues of, of, uh, of disagreement, there aren't any. We have, we have given the definitive answer and then somebody stumbles along and finds a new piece of information. It's like, oh, we hadn't, we hadn't thought of that. Uh, we've got to come up with a new answer. We'll get back to you. Well, I thought you had it down. Well, <laughs> see, we don't know what we don't know. And, uh, but God does. God is the creator of all that is. He is um, omniscient. He knows all things. And he knows what he's going to do. He's not bound by time. He knows tomorrow just as well as as he knows today and yesterday. And so Jesus sprung this question on them. He said in Mark chapter uh, chapter 12, verses uh, 36. By the way, we are going to get back to Hebrews. We'll get there. In Mark chapter 12, verses 36 and 37, it says, For for David himself said by the Holy Ghost, in other words, under, under inspiration, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, we read that from Psalm 2 this morning. David, therefore, himself called him, referring to the Messiah, Lord. Whence is he then his son? Now, understand in Jewish culture that you could not, you did not Submit yourself. You, you, you were the authority. You were the higher person on the, on the social ladder if you were the elder, if you were the father or the grandfather or the great-grandfather. And the very notion of bowing to your son, to acknowledge the authority of your son over you, was, was totally opposite of the culture and the understanding. I'll give you an illustration of this. And this is, this is mother's son. Who was the most, glor- from, a human, from a worldly perspective, who was the most glorious king in ancient Israel? Solomon. The palaces, the wealth, the influence, the empire that he had. And his mother comes to him with a request. And there's two things that are very interesting. There's, again, almost mentioned in passing. Number one. He gets off of his throne and bows before her. It's the only place you ever see Solomon bow before a human being. And number two, he brings a throne for a throne for her to sit on on his right hand, the place of honor. 
You bow to your ancestors. You bow to your predecessors. You bow to your fathers, your grandfathers, and so on. And here David is referring to his descendant as his Lord. That's just not part of the deal. That isn't how it works. And Jesus asks the Pharisees this question, and there's no answer. Because the the answer is self-evident. That Messiah is greater than just a man who happens to be the heir to the throne of Israel, who is the descendant of David. He's greater. And he has to be greater than David, who was, you know, way up here. He's the, he's the pinnacle of Israel's kings. He is, he is the, the standard. He's the gold standard. This is the guy we tried to attain to, and this one is, you know, above and beyond. So the nature of Messiah was something that was, that was beyond their scope. They couldn't understand how great Messiah was. They knew he was great, but now he's, he's greater than David. And that was virtually unimaginable. They didn't seem to understand that it was possible that the promised Messiah would be David's descendant and his Lord. Because Jesus is greater than David. Jesus has to be a number of things if he is to be our Lord. If he is going to not only be our Lord, but to accomplish the task that God God the Father has given him. So we're going to look at these things in uh, in Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 5. By the way, Hebrews, if you have a New American Standard, or I've got a King James here, but uh, uh, it does the same thing that the New American Standard does, that Old Testament quotations are all in caps. And Hebrews has got a huge amount of quotations from the Old Testament. And we're going to be looking at two quotations. One is from uh, the psalm that we read earlier this morning, Psalm 2. He says in verse verse 5, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest... But he, that, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have, have I begotten thee. So let's, uh, let's look at a couple of things. If we looked, remember, and if you want to turn there, you can, you can, you can glance down at that, but try to pay attention to what we're, what we're talking about here. Psalm 2 does not deal with the priesthood. So why is he talking about this? Because this is going to tie into the priesthood. Psalm 2 deals with the king. It deals with the scope of who the king is. The king is, according to Psalm 2, the son of God. The king will also rule. It says, I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and you will rule to the ends of the earth. He will will rule the world. When Christ returns, he will rule the world. And that's not just Psalm 2. That's a number of places in Scripture we could look at. He will rule the world when he returns. So we have this this great person. If we are dealing with the billions and billions of people who have lived throughout the course of, of human history and into the future, who is the greatest? Well, by default, we only have one who is God incarnate. We only have one who could be the greatest because he is God incarnate. And that puts him, that makes him David's Lord and beyond. That puts him beyond all other human beings infinitely. We are dealing with God incarnate, who humanly speaking is the heir to to David's throne. All right? Matthew chapter 1, you have that genealogy. Remember, the genealogies are, I know, when you're reading your Bible... And you're going through your Bible reading program, and you go, oh boy, I'm looking, wonder what I'm going to be reading today. And it's a genealogy, and immediately you just go, oh. Genealogies, everything you've got in this book is for a reason. The genealogies are important. The Matthew chapter 1 genealogy is the pedigree of the king. Now, Queen Elizabeth passed away here a couple weeks ago. And some people have gotten, well, let's see, that means that Charles is now king, and that means that, that, that William is now Prince of Wales, and that when Charles dies, then, then, then William will be king. And I can't remember the name of William's little boy. So, 
What's that? George. Okay, yeah, see, you guys all know this. <laughs> and, then, and then one of these days, after William dies, then George gets to be king. We know the pedigree. There's, there's a, this guy, and then this guy, and then this guy, and then, you know, eventually there'll be somebody else, and, and, and we have follow the line. Okay, Matthew chapter 1 is the exact same thing. Except, we get to this character by the name of Zechariah, and he's the last king. And he didn't have any children that survived. So we have to go to his predecessor to follow the line, a fellow named Jehoiakim who was carried away captive when he was eight years old. And he never, and he was only on the throne for three months. So how does this carry on? We have, we have five, over 500 years, almost 600 years. When Matthew was written, 600 years had passed since there had been a king on the throne in Jerusalem, a legitimate king. God had promised that one of his, had promised David, this is the Davidic covenant, we see this in, uh, let's see, I've got the references down here somewhere. Put my, my eyes on here. This is in, um, in Second Chronicles chapter, or First Chronicles chapter 17, and then also Second uh, Samuel chapter 6. Where God promises that one of David's descendants will rule forever. Now, some of us thought Elizabeth was going to rule, was going to reign forever. <laughs> People die. You can look at all the kings in history, all the queens in history, all the emperors and so on throughout history, and you know what? They all have one thing in common. They died. And yet God has promised that one of David's descendants would rule forever. How is that possible? Well, Jesus is the heir. And yes, he died. He gave his life on Calvary's cross. He was buried, but he rose again, never to die again. And when he returns, there will never be a successor to Jesus. He will rule and reign forever. It will never end. And so we have this rule of king. Worldwide rule, an eternal rule. The the nations of the world will be under him and they will come and pay homage to him. And he has a threefold right probably come up with more as well, but I'm going to focus on these. Threefold rule, a right to rule. Number one, and we're going to be looking at this uh, a little bit today, and then again in chapter 7, the idea that he, that Melchizedek, and I'm not going to go into a whole lot of discussion about who that is and so on until we get to chapter 7, because it's expanded on there. But the type of Melchizedek. Of, pro, of priest and king wrapped into one individual. We don't have that any place else in the Old Testament. Melchizedek is a type of Christ. So the typology of Melchizedek as the priest king. We have the, uh, the right that God has given by his promise in the Davidic covenant. That an heir of David will occupy the throne of Israel forever. When, when Gabriel gave the Annunciation to Mary in Luke. One of the things that, she, that, that, that the angel tells Mary is that God will give him the throne of his father, David. Now, again, it's been hundreds and hundreds of years since one of the kings, the heirs, have actually sat on the throne. But it will happen. It will happen. It's promised. Jesus is that person. And then most importantly, and that's the one we're focusing on here, is he's the son of God. You know, the kingdom of God is really in two aspects. One is we're dealing with, when it says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, that's all in future. So that aspect of the kingdom is future. But there is a sense where God, as the sovereign of all that is, is ruling today. And the fact that God is the the king of all that is. 
Is Jesus God? Yes, he is. Jesus is God incarnate. He is the creator. We can go to John chapter 1 uh, and verse 1. Let's, look, let's go ahead and turn there. I want you to see this. I'm not making this stuff up. This is, this is standard stuff. John chapter 1. Let's look at the first three verses of John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word. We'll come back to that. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, just in verse 1, we have the Word, we have God, and yet they are the same. God is the Word, the Word is God. The same was in the beginning with God. This is getting confusion. This is why we have the Trinity. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. So He is the Creator, and He is God. Drop down to verse 14. Coming back to the Word again. We're going to identify the Word. We know from verse 1 that the Word is God. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, this Word, who is God, became one of us, dwelt among us. This is Jesus. And the book of Isaiah says there was no beauty that we should behold. And there was nothing extraordinary about, the, about the, the, the appearance of Jesus. All kinds of extraordinary things about his, his character his, and who he is and what he did. But to look at him, look like the rest of the crowd. He was one of us. And yet he's still God. He didn't stop being God. He's God. And so we have God without stop. He, he didn't stop being God. But he also became a man. He's both. And he's the only one ever in the past, present, or future that will be that. So, back to our text in Hebrews. He has the right to rule because of the type that we see here that we'll expand on. He has the right to rule because of God's promise in the Davidic covenant. And he has the right to rule because he is God the Son. By the way, there was never a point in time when Jesus became the Son. My, 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 I, w- I really wish you could be there. I have my little cluster of theologues that we, we talk on Wednesday nights. This is, this is the highlight of I, I enjoy doing this. I really do t- today. But my, my Wednesday, night, Wednesday night prayer meeting, and for those of you who, guys... Come to Wednesday night prayer meeting. It's at Leo's house. If you don't know how to get there, we'll get you directions. But we have, we have more fun. Am I right? We, this is great. I love this. We have, we have Bible study. Then we have prayer time. Now, normally, most churches, prayer meeting is about an hour long, you know. And at Leo's, it's, it's two hours. <laughs> because we have, we have Bible study, then prayer meeting, and then we... We sit around and we, we bring up one or two theological discussion, discussions and we talk about it. And we answer the questions and we go through these things and, and, and hash out these things. And it's great! So I don't know if you guys, I don't know if I'd like it. We have a great time. We really do. This is right up your alley. Did Jesus become the Son of God, at a point in time? And the answer is no. There's a a theological concept called eternal generation. He did not become the Son at the Incarnation. There was never a point in time when he became the Son. A couple things to consider. Number one, God is immutable. God does not change. God is perfect. If you monkey with perfection, it ceases to be perfect. God did not become the Son at a point in time, just like the Father didn't become the Father at a point in time, or the Spirit didn't become the Spirit at a point in time. They always have been. The relationships of the, within the Godhead are eternal. And so Jesus is the Son of Man. That was his favorite title for himself. He's the Son of God. He is the heir to the throne of David. 
Okay, we've got all that. These are, these are, these are high credentials. This is, a, this is a, a, an extraordinary person. This is the greatest person who has ever lived. The greatest man who has ever lived. And he's sinless. And he's perfect. All right, that's all great and wonderful. Our theme in Hebrews is the priesthood. This is what we talked about last week. So with these high credentials, how do we still get him to be a priest? Your Old Testament, you have Leviticus. And you also have large sections of other books of the Bible that deal with what the priests do and who they are. This is part of the genealogy thing. Because in your Old Testament, the first high priest was a guy named Aaron, Moses' brother. And he had two sons that survived, Eleazar and Ithamar. You don't have to remember, there won't be a quiz on this. All the priests of Israel, and they multiplied, and there ended up being thousands and thousands and thousands of them, and their descendants are still here today, and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Any Jewish guy whose last name is Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, is a descendant of a priest. The word Cohen means priest in Hebrew. That's how they were able to keep track of this even though it hasn't been a temple for 2,000 years. All the priests are the descendants of these guys. And as I mentioned in the introduction, we have this, this quandary. How can you have a king? Jesus was of the line of David. David was of the line of the tribe of Judah, who was Levi's brother. All, Aaron is a descendant of, of Levi. You can't, if, if, since we're dealing with hereditary positions... You can't have both. I can't go back and change who my great, 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 great grandfather is. So how can you have a guy who is both priest and king? How do you resolve this quandary that we talked about in the beginning? Ah! You ever notice that that very often when you're trying to resolve a, a perplexing dilemma, the, the problem has to do with the fact that your starting point is wrong. You, you are assuming that something is so, or you're assuming that, that we're operating in this particular area, or we're assuming that this is part, these are the facts that we have to deal with. And the, and, and, the, and the point is that sometimes we have one of our, our facts wrong in the beginning, which is why we're not going to come to the right conclusion. The assumption is that the priest has to be a descendant of Aaron. He has to be a Levitical priest. But that's not the case. Is there another priesthood in the Old Testament? Yes. And this is how we're going to reconcile these two things. Verse 6, we're going to quote another psalm. As he said in another place, he's, and by the way, he, when, when he's doing, he, he, he does this, the, book, the, in, the author of the book of Hebrews says, in another place, and some place he says this, and some, he doesn't give chapter and, refer, chapter and verse. Why? Because there were no chapters and verses when this was done, all right? Chapters and verse divisions in your Bible didn't come into existence until four or five hundred years ago. But he is quoting. He's going to quote from Psalm 110. <clears throat> As he said also in another place, thou art a pri-, referring to Messiah, referring to Messiah, thou art a priest forever, so your priesthood will never end, after the order of Melchizedek. Now, by the way, the, the, Mormon, the, the Mormons have a, an order of Melchizedek. They also have an Aaronic priesthood. Don't even go there. They've got, got it all wrong. It's not in accord with the Bible. They made it up out of whole cloth. Their whole understanding of this is totally off the wall and totally wrong. So don't even go there. Who is Melchizedek? What is the order of Melchizedek? All right. Way back in Genesis. Way back in Genesis. We had a uh, a guy named Melchizedek. He's only mentioned in Genesis in three verses. Then he's gone. And then he's mentioned again in Psalm 110, and that's all he's mentioned in the Old Testament. That's all. He's talked about more in the book of Hebrews by far than he is talked about in the Old Testament because of the implications of this. 
All right. When he's mentioned in Genesis, he's mentioned in his interactions with a guy named Abraham. All right. This is back in, way back in Genesis 14. This is before Isaac was born. Abraham has no kids at this point in time. If Abraham has no kids, this, doesn't, this means that Isaac hasn't come along, this means that Jacob hasn't come along, which means that, that Levi hasn't come along, which certainly means that, yes, that's all true, because we're talking about 500 years before Aaron. Back in those days, back in the days of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and their compadres, who, who, oper, who, who was the priest? How did the priesthood work back in those days? Well, normally it was the head of the family. Abraham offered sacrifices. Noah offered sacrifices. Isaac and Jacob offered sacrifices. They were the heads of the families. And it says that Melchizedek was priest of the Most High God. And he was also king of Salem. The city of Salem. So, this is the only guy we've got in the whole Old Testament who is a priest and a king wrapped into one. By the way, just in passing, Salem is Jerusalem. The word is shalom, Jerusalem, means peace, that's all it means. And so he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek as opposed to the order of Aaron. We don't have to worry about the genealogy. We don't have to worry about him being descended from Aaron or Levi. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Oh, okay, that's great, that's wonderful. What's that? How does one become a a priest after the order of Melchizedek when Melchizedek is only mentioned in four verses in the Old Testament? Now, we'll expand on this when we get to chapter 7, so we'll save some of that till then. It means that he was appointed by God. It's not hereditary. That's what we need to take away from this. Don't try to find, we'll we'll deal with that later on. But the main point, the takeaway you need to have is that it's an appointed thing, not hereditary. And so God can say, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God assigned him that position. So Jesus is the heir to the throne. He is the king of Israel. Nathaniel said, thou art the king of Israel, and he was right. He's also our great high priest. He's both. He doesn't have to be a descendant of Aaron. He is, he is from the order of Melchizedek, which, by the way, is a greater priesthood. We'll get to that when we get to chapter 7. So we don't have two messiahs. We have one person who is both priest and king which gives him the right to rule and the right to mediate and offer sacrifice. And in his case, one sacrifice done once for all time, which was himself. Did you follow all that? All right. Verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, we're referring to Jesus, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Now, let me do some, some, some explaining here because there's some confusion in the translation. And it has to do with simply a choice of words. But let's, okay, we have Jesus praying. There are cry, there's crying out, loud voice, there's tears involved. Where do we see that in your gospel accounts? There's two possibilities, and it may, the passage may be referring to both. We deal with Gethsemane, and then we deal with the cross. We deal with the cross. He was heard of God, it says, because of his fear. The word fear is a poor choice of words. Um, let's, let's look at it this way. Number one, Jesus was not afraid. 
Jesus was not afraid. He knew how, he knew why, he knew what he was... was. In John chapter 3, in his discussion with Nicodemus, which took place almost three years before his crucifixion, over two years before, Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must, so even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus knew that he would die by crucifixion in advance. He knew it. He's not going into this not knowing what's lying ahead. He does, he's going into this with his eyes open. He knows that he is the Lamb of God. He, is, he knows that his purpose is to be the Lamb of God, to give his life because he told his disciples also that, uh, that I'm going to be betrayed, I will be crucified, and I will rise again. He knew what his mission was. He knew what was, what was coming. The idea here of fear is the idea of reverence. If you have a New American Standard, it'll quote this as piety. It's the idea of being in awe of God. When we're told to, that we need to fear God, it isn't necessarily conveying the idea, although it's part of it, is the idea of being afraid of God. But the idea of giving God the, 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 the reverence, the worship, that is his due. My response to God, a proper, appropriate relationship and response to the Father. And it also conveys the idea of his submission. Let's look at the next verse. For though he were a son, yet he learned, yet, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Our Lord used this... Uh, in a question to the, to the Pharisees as well. If I know what, if, let's say my, my dad gives me, I could tell all kinds of stories. If my, ga- my dad gives me an assignment, my teacher gives me an assignment, I'm given an assignment. You, my boss, you are to do this at this time, in this place, and this is how you're to do it, and this is what, what the outcome is going to be. But this is what you need to be doing, and here's when and how and you, you need to do it. And we all go through this. When I'm given my instructions, the whole thing is theoretical. Well, I may or may not. I may make a mistake somewhere along the way. I may blunder this. I may misunderstand. I may, it may not turn out exactly as the person giving me the instructions has uh, had in mind. So it's theoretical. But for Jesus, none of that was theoretical. It was theoretical when it was given, but he fulfilled it exactly as was assigned. He fulfilled exactly what God had decreed in the Old Testament. He fulfilled the mission, the task that was assigned him. And that's what it's mentioning there in verse 8. That though we were a son, yet, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect. And again, this is one of those, uh, those expressions that we see that don't quite convey the, the thought in, in English. Was Jesus perfect? Yes! Was there ever a time when he wasn't? No. He was perfect and is perfect. So how did he become perfect? What's the idea of perfect in your Bible? It's not flawless. It conveys a different idea. It's the idea of completion or fulfillment. Or maturity. But bringing to, to completion the thing of whatever it might be. It might be your character, it might be an assignment, it might be a job, something like that. In this particular case, it's the assignment, it's the task, it's the commission. He completed all that was necessary for the redemption of humanity. Jesus came in this world, into this world as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And when he left this world, when he ascended from, from, uh, from Mount of Olives, he had completed everything the Father had assigned him. He was perfected. He had accomplished all that was given to him to do. And since that was the case, being made perfect, having completed that, having fulfilled all that, he became, here's the wonderful thing, this is what applies to you and me. Everything else is like, wow, we're just impressed by the person and, and everything else. But this is what, what it means to you and me. 
This is why we have God becoming a man. This is why we have the king becoming a priest. This is why we have him suffering and being obedient and living among us as a man and doing all these things is to bring about what we have here at the end of verse 9. He became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's the author of eternal life. All right, let's use that word author again. Let's look at the, we're going to define our terms again. When we think of the idea of author, we're thinking about the guy who wrote a book. That's our general idea. But the word in the original language here conveys the idea of the source or the cause of something, which is where we get the idea of the author of the book. He's the source, the cause of the book. But biblically, it's beyond the idea of books. It's the source or the cause. So he is the the source of what? Eternal salvation. There is no eternal life apart from Jesus Christ. He is the source of eternal life. He is the author. And, conveying the same idea, he is the cause of it as well. We've mentioned many times, and you need to get this, you need to understand, because people, what, what's this cross thing? Why is this necessary? Why did Jesus die? What is the purpose of the cross? God's justice had to be satisfied. Sin's penalty had to be paid. God cannot let people go off free without punishment, because he ceases to be just. God is a God of justice. And so the punishment has to be has to be met. Justice has to be met. The debt has to be paid. In order for God to forgive, Jesus, God himself, comes and pays our debt so that we might be forgiven. He is the, not only the source, he is the cause of eternal life. There is no other means. I've issued the challenge before. Somebody's going to eventually do this. And it's been done before, which is why I can safely say this. Since God is holy, since God is just, and since God is also loving, gracious, and merciful, and God is immutable, he cannot stop being this or stop being this. He must be these. And he can't change. How can God forgive you. How do you reconcile his holiness and his justice with his love, grace, and mercy? I'm a condemned sinner. There's nothing I can do to solve my problem on my own. And everybody else around me is in the same boat. We can't help each other. I, as far as eternity is concerned, as far as satisfying the justice of God, we're all, we're all doomed and damned. And there's nothing, I have nothing at my disposal I am bankrupt. I have nothing to offer God. So how can the debt be paid? God does it himself. God does it himself. God, the king, becomes the priest to offer the sacrifice to pay the penalty of sin that I can be forgiven. And he became the author of eternal salvation. And to all that obey him, called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. The greatest being who has ever been or ever will be did this for you and for me. Heavenly Father, thank you. It is beyond our ability to thank you enough for what you did. We have before us the greatest gift imaginable. 
and it's offered to us freely. It can't be earned. It can't be bought. It can't be... It's ours as a gift. And Christ did it all for us. Father, thank you. Lord, if there's somebody here today that never received the gift, may today be that gift. May it be, may it be received, this gift of eternal life. Father, thank you. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's stand, please.